Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the Oxford Martin School. My name is Achim Steiner, recently appointed director of the Oxford Martin School, and um, now increasingly getting used to being the proud host of very fascinating lectures and research that is ongoing. Let me warmly welcome you on an increasingly cold day um, and time of the year. It's our great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Craig Holmes, who will speak to a topic that has, over the last few years, become more and more part of a, a discourse that the Oxford Martin School is proud to have been part of developing, both within Oxford, but increasingly also in, in a global context. Um, much work goes on across Oxford on the frontiers of technology, but also, more recently, a great deal of attention being paid on not just the possibilities of technology, but rather um, their broader implications, what they may catalyze, including on issues that have to do very much with um, social and economic inequality. Um, Dr. Craig Holmes has made this the focus of his work, um, being both part of Pembroke, but also in the context of his work with the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and in particular will focus today in his lecture on skills, education, work in the digital age on some of the implications of these technology pathways and innovations that are underway and how they're changing the nature of innovation, of employment, and yes, also potentially perpetuating inequalities in a way that we may not have thought of or conceived of at the time or at the point of where technology is invented or becomes usable. So once again, um, a very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, Craig, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you all uh, for being here today. Um, and uh, to the Martin School for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I kind of arrive at this topic having spent a couple of years thinking about um, the impact of recent changes in um, for example, the sort of occupations that people do and the way that's been shifted by changes in, in technology and the impacts that has had on, on earnings um, over the past couple of decades. And so what I'm trying to, trying to do with this talk is take some of the lessons from that and apply the growing literature and the growing research on um, what the future might hold in terms of technological developments, uh, changes in the sorts of jobs people are doing, um, and say something about maybe what would happen to inequalities in the future, what will happen to the, the, the nature of work um, in the future, and what the response of uh, skills policy uh, might need to be to deal with some of those um, challenges. Um, probably one thing worth pointing out, so a way is, is while the inequality is a very large topic, covers many different aspects, this is particularly thinking about the labour market, and particularly thinking about um, earnings inequality as a subset um, of that. Um, okay, so um, it is um, obvious and um, there's a huge amount of evidence to show that technology has been a key driver of the sorts of occupations that um, uh, any economy um, has available to it at any particular point in time. Um, and that set of occupations, that occupational structure, uh, is a key determinant of um, the uh, sorts of wages people earn and their distribution. Um, and uh, for the demand, um, the, the demand for uh, skills. And uh, that obviously then relates very closely to uh, the sorts of wages people uh, are able to earn in that uh, labor market. And there's no reason to think that the technologies that um, have developed over the last 20, 30 years that have, have had that sort of impact um, are in that respect any different to the sorts of new technologies that might emerge from this point forwards, that uh, some occupations will grow, some occupations will decline, that will change the nature of um, skills that are necessary and uh, have a knock-on effect on, on uh, people's um, pay. Um, so I'm going to um, try and focus on three things here. First is, is to give a bit of a sense about what um, changes in the occupational structure we might imagine might be the case, and there are a number of different people who have uh, written uh, about this, and I, I treat myself very much as a, as a consumer of that literature. And um, we'll then like to, to say something about whether or not that technology, or those new technologies, is likely to impact on 
the nature of uh, the nature of jobs as well as the sorts of jobs that exist. So for occupations that uh, continue to exist in the future, where they will look differently, whether they'll have a different combination of tasks and require different sorts of skills, and then have some chance to reflect on whether that has some implications for um, inequalities in pay and um, in, in the uh, response of government interest in developing the skills of their workforce and later on. Um, so as a first approximation, uh, the occupational structure uh, is, is a good summary of the sorts of skills that uh, a labour market and an economy um, requires. Um, that any occupation is a sort of well-defined set of tasks at any point in time, and those tasks require certain um, capabilities. Um, in general, over the past um, number of decades, uh, technological change has led to an increase in the demand for um, skills, uh, sorry, an increase in the demand for higher um, skills. And we have seen a growth in higher skill occupations, things like professional uh, work, managerial occupations, um, technical sorts of occupations. And the reason for that is that those occupations tend to complement the sorts of technologies that have, that have been um, um, created, that uh, professionals, managers, technicians are more productive in their jobs when they have a greater availability of new, uh, uh, new technologies. Um, however, it isn't quite as simple as defining between um, high skill and less skill occupations. Um, and that's largely because technology complements particular sorts of tasks. And while the sorts of tasks performed by high skilled workers are the ones that complement it most, um, it's not the tasks performed by the lowest skilled jobs that are uh, most substitutable with, with music technologies, it tends to be those in somewhere near the middle of the distribution um, of, of uh, skills and of um, pay. So the sorts of tasks performed by people in um, manufacturing jobs, semi-skilled processing jobs, people, sort of skills, sort of tasks performed by people in uh, clerical um, occupations, have been the, been the ones that have experienced the most amount of substitution um, uh, with um, ICT capital, whereas people um, in um, lower skilled service jobs or low skilled jobs that have sort of a face-to-face -face interaction um, are a lot less affected by, by that sort of substitution, or at least that's been the case um, up to now. And in some instances we see growth in those sorts of occupations, in part because um, uh, people who are no longer able to find work in the middle skill have to find jobs elsewhere. And in some cases, because um, there might be a growing demand for these um, uh, service uh, type occupations caused by growing inequalities at the top of the uh, distribution. Um, so if we look um, across uh, Europe um, uh, over a bunch of different time periods um, for where these occupations have been growing or, or in decline, these first three groups, um, managers, professionals and technicians are the high school occupations referred to beforehand. And at least until 2008 and the onset of the recession, um, uh, compared to a period of time in the, um, in the 1980s, there are more of these occupations around. Clerical support workers are, uh, are, are far uh, are fewer um, uh, today than they were um, in the past. Um, trade and related, traf uh, uh, related trades workers, craft and related trades workers um, are also um, far uh, less frequently uh, observed, um, and in many cases, those sorts of production processes have been placed by, by automated um, production lines. Um, whereas um, sales workers um, have grown over this time period, and even the most um, elementary, um, low skill occupations that have, have, have suffered very little. There's a lot of variation around that. If that's the European picture, then different countries have experienced this sort of um, hollowing out, this, this shifting away from um, routine middle level work. Uh, at different rates. Um, the um, uh, one way of illustrating this is, is, is a table taken from paper by Osh and uh, Rodriguez Menes um, a few years ago. Um, and they compare Germany and the UK and Switzerland and Spain for the growth and decline in, in jobs at the top, uh, middle, and bottom end of the, uh, the distribution. And um, somewhere like the UK begins this, this, this hollowing out, this, this shift towards higher paying and lower paying, high skill and low skill jobs um, far, uh, far earlier, um, in, uh, starting from sort of the, uh, throughout the, the, the 80s and, and 90s, we, we, we see that the, the share of lower skill occupations um, growing in importance, even if perhaps the, the, the overall numbers are not uh, quite, as, uh, quite as large. Whereas for somewhere like um, uh, Germany or Switzerland, that, that occurs um, much later. So there is around this kind of European picture, and in fact this, this uh, developed um, 
uh, rich country um, picture some variation. There are, uh, uh, there are um, uh, sorry, that around the trend there are some, some important variations. Um, but but the, the overall picture is one of, of, of declining um, um, sorts of jobs that we think of as being in some way routine. And I'm going to use routine to mean um, jobs for which, however um, uh, skillful they might be, they comprise a series of tasks that are repeated again and again and again. Um, so someone working on a production line or someone involved in clerical work fits that description more so than someone involved in um, shelf stacking or um, uh, acting as a, as a cashier as much as someone who is doing very high skilled um, creative or um, abstract uh, work. Um, okay. So that's the picture up to um, this point in time. The recent discussion around the impact of new technologies, um, in one way, is, is widening the um, net across sort of occupations that might be more substitutable with technology um, in the future. And in some of the more extreme um, uh, estimates of the, of the impact of um, technology on the sorts of jobs that are available, um, it really does seem like uh, quite a large number of both lower and middle school jobs are at very, very high risks of being um, completely eradicated by technology, which leads to um, the, the prospect to, that possibly there just aren't enough jobs and that people that might want to, to work in the future. And that's one implication. What I also want to focus on in this talk is that, well, maybe technological unemployment, the loss of jobs caused by um, uh, technology doing most of the work, um, isn't the only thing that might happen, that within occupations maybe things will um, change. So while the headcount of someone doing a particular job um, might stay pretty constant, the nature of that work um, can change. And in part that can be related to uh, changes in pay. So if something's changing to the nature of the job, uh, it might be involve a different combination of tasks than what it might have involved 20 or 30 years ago, we'd expect that to have a, a relationship with, with pay. And the willingness to accept um, pay uh, decreases um, or, or not may have a, um, a relationship with whether those jobs disappear or whether or not they are still performed by people but by um, with, with um, far lower earnings. Um, okay, so I um, mentioned um, um, that there are a range of different scenarios predicted for the impact of uh, digital technologies in the future. And um, where I'm going to start is the work by uh, Mike Osborne and Carl Frey um, here at INET who have for various different countries um, over the last couple of years, um, in providing estimates of the, 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 the level of risk uh, that um, certain occupations have for being um, automated. Uh, I'm not going to spend um, any time trying to describe their sophisticated methodology for uh, providing these, 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 these estimates. Um, it's a combination of um, expert input and uh, analysis of the tasks being performed and some um, algorithmic uh, imputation. Um, but what they, what they find is that there are, um, looking across all the jobs in, um, in their first uh, bit of work, work on this, the United States, um, approximately 47%, so just under half of the jobs that they would say have a high risk of being um, fully automated, um, no longer requiring of um, human uh, labor. Uh, and this is spread across uh, a range of different areas of the labor market, um, but it particularly includes um, the sorts of lower skill service jobs that until this point in time had been somewhat outside of the risk of being replaced by technology in a way that middle skill routine jobs had not been. Um, so the automation of um, jobs within supermarkets and within restaurants would be, would be one example there where previously the technology just did not exist um, that meant that, uh, uh, that that work could be done by a machine and not by a, uh, by a person serving somebody face to face. Um, given that the UK and the US have um, different labor markets in terms of their, their, their composition, um, then we expect to find there are, there are different uh, uh, um, risks of, of, of automation and, uh, and job loss. And the figure they estimate for the UK is 135%. Uh, so there's still a relatively high number of jobs that they would argue um, from, from this approach are at high risk of being, um, being lost uh, to, uh, to uh, new digital technologies. Um, I think the last thing to, to say on that point is that um, some of those jobs that we're talking about are also high skill. So while there is a lot of emphasis on maybe the low skill service uh, jobs, um, there are also some, some higher skill um, jobs in there that are, that are also, um, uh, also at risk. And, and, and maybe high skill jobs in general are more immune to this phenomenon, but not, not entirely. 
Um, okay. Now, an implication of this for skills policy is that um, we may be getting it entirely wrong in forecasting the sorts of jobs that are going to exist in the future and the sorts of skills that will be necessary to perform those jobs. And one of the reasons that that happens is because most skills forecasts are backward looking. Um, they take um, uh, existing trends in the sorts of occupations that are growing, the sorts of sectors that are growing. They are able to capture uh, maybe changes in, in the, the nature of aggregate demand that might lead to some sectors growing faster than others and other, other aspects. But they are essentially using data from the past to impute something about the future. And if the world carries on as it, as, as it always has, then that's, that's not a, a bad approximation. But if these new digital technologies do reflect a, a different paradigm, that the sorts of jobs that are likely to complement or be substituted by this technology um, is different in the future as it has been in the past, then um, we could be expecting people to be necessary for certain occupations that are just not going to exist. Uh, and any skills developed towards that um, might be um, misguided. Um, so what I've provided here is a, as a comparison of uh, the Frey and Osborne figures of the, the risk uh, that occupation gets um, automated or, or replaced by computer technology, and the current government estimates for the, 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 the projected increase in um, uh, 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 people necessary to do uh, a particular uh, occupation. Um, this is quite a small table on this screen. I have no idea if it's a visible table from the back um, of the room, but I want to highlight a couple of main points that necessarily focus on, on, on an individual uh, row. The first is that there are a number of occupations that are predicted to grow. For example, um, the uh, um, caring personal services occupation um, that has a very high uh, expectation of, of, of amount of people going into the occupation. That has, by Frey and Osborne's estimates, just under 50% chance of being, of being automated. Um, a similar story could be told for uh, uh, customer services occupations. Uh, so that's, that's picking up the, 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 the fact that we might be looking at very different technologies and, and their relationship with this sort of work um, in the future as well has been in the past. There are also some, um, some high skill examples of this. So um, science, um, engineering and technology associate professionals, so technician, lab technicians, that sort of, that sorts of uh, uh, individuals, people who work alongside engineers, um, and um, complement their work, are, have a, by Fred Osborne's estimate, uh, just slightly greater than 50% chance of being automated. And yet this is a, uh, this is a group that we still expect to be, to be growing uh, over time. Similarly, um, what we describe as business or public service associate professionals, so people like financial um, analysts um, whose um, uh, analysis, their, their, their skills and their work helps complement, say, a um, uh, higher skilled um, professional in in finance or, or, in, or in public service. Um, that's a, 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 group, a group expected to grow in, again, very large numbers, 349,000 extra people required between 2014 and 2024. And yet, the estimated probability by Fred Osborne's numbers of being automated is, is again approaching that 50%. Um, so there's some disparities there that current projections are not taking into account. And that, that's, that should be a concern for, for skills policy. We take those, those automation risks as being, um, uh, as being serious. Um, now, what this doesn't say anything about is what sort of jobs might be created um, in the future. This is really just capturing the occupations that exist now and uh, whether they might disappear. Um, and there are undoubtedly occupations that exist today that um, didn't exist um, five, ten years ago. We might expect that sort of trend to carry on in the future. Um, this is a table taken from data supplied by LinkedIn on the sorts of occupations that were, not, were barely listed at all. Um, in 2008 and now appear in very large numbers. So top two are developers for iPhones, uh, app developers for iPhones, and Android developers. And I like to imagine that in 2008, Android developer meant a very different thing uh, to what it does today, someone just in their shed making a robot. Uh, but now there was almost 10,000 people um, who um, are um, uh, developing software for, for an, um, um, Android phones um, that um, are listed on, on LinkedIn, so there might be, in fact, many, many more of that. So a huge growth there. Um, there are a couple that are not to do with technology, like Zumba Instructor and something called a Beach Body Coach, which I know absolutely nothing um, about. Um, but again, very large, large numbers. Um, so not, not all to do with sort of technology and, and its relationship with that. Um, maybe a, a change in fashions towards um, certain sorts of fitness regimes will also be a, a driver factor. But certainly lots of things that are very much related to 
uh, to tech, um, and some of those I have no idea. I don't know what a big data architect does or a cloud services specialist does, but, but sort of related to, to, to ICT um, work. Um, but even for those numbers, it's not obvious that they are big enough to deal with the sort of risks we've been talked about on the previous slide, that if huge numbers of jobs are at risk of automation, whether these sorts of, sort of occupations are going to arise in sufficient numbers to, to provide a, a decent alternative. Um, okay. Now, one thing that we said about the sorts of um, um, estimates of uh, risk of, uh, of automation is that they sort of take an occupation as a whole um, and say, well, an occupation either is um, high risk of being automated, in which case all those jobs go, or low risk, in which case most of those jobs um, remain. But actually, jobs are a combination of tasks, some of which might be more automatable than others. And um, that might mean that many jobs continue to exist in the future, but um, uh, or, or maybe called the same sorts of things, have the same sort of titles, but they look um, um, very different. And in some cases, that might lead to um, an increase in, in the, the required skill of, of workers doing those jobs and the pay that goes along with that. Um, so um, to give um, a couple of illustrative examples, uh, we might imagine that in the past, the role of uh, stock checking was fairly labor intensive. You quite actually someone to check um, uh, stock was coming into a, into a shop and um, um, there was no sort of automated process for, for doing that. Now, for the most part, those things are scanned, that there is a, a database that checks um, uh, when um, uh, things are running low. There might be some um, automatic ordering that goes on that doesn't require a human to do that particular work. The person who's doing stock check might be out of a job as a result of that. Um, on the other hand, they might be able to, uh, to devise a, a, a higher skill job that uses the data provided by um, uh, these new technologies, uh, sees when certain things are going, um, uh, being sold uh, uh, faster or, or slower, is able to understand and analyze those sorts of patterns, and create some sort of service for that business that, that generates um, greater, a greater value by, by, by interacting with the data provided, interacting with that new, new technology. Um, so there, there's, there's an alternative there that involves a new sort of job being created that complements the technology where the tasks that, that person was doing in the past that were substitutable disappear. Um, equally, those that are involved in um, bookkeeping uh, might find that sort of the more routine parts of that, that job are now uh, much more um, automated. Uh, but there are higher skill jobs within uh, finance or accounting that are opened up for them, given a certain amount of skill investment. Um, uh, that, that only arise because those new technologies that, that replace the bookkeeper's routine occupation um, and their routine tasks um, uh, now exist. Um, on the other hand, um, technology has the capability to change the content of jobs in um, um, uh, maybe a less positive direction and, and shift existing work that is, or might already think of as being fairly non-routine, towards being um, more routine. And this is particularly uh, a, a problem or, or uh, a concern in, in higher skill occupations. So um, the, the value that many high skill occupations have is the, um, the sort of knowledge they might bring to solving a particular problem. And, and um, without uh, particular high levels of technology, that sort of, uh, that sort of knowledge work has to be done by a person who's able to reason, to solve problems, to think creatively. Um, with a, uh, with a high enough level of technology, it might be possible for many of those sorts of problems to be turned into a computer algorithm. And um, Brown, Loud, and Ashton talk about this in their book, um, The Global Auction, the phenomenon of digital tailorism, where the knowledge work of high school individuals is codified, is standardized, and uh, makes the, the work that people who are doing those jobs far less um, um, creative, far less uh, requiring a skill, and far more routine. They're, um, uh, the example that I, that I always like from that book is that of the bank manager. Think about what a bank manager used to do 20, 25 years ago. Um, they might have local knowledge, um, and if someone were to approach uh, that bank manager asking for a loan, they would use their knowledge of, of um, what they know about the local labor market, about the local economy, and make an informed assessment about whether or not someone um, receives a loan for a particular business investment. That's highly skilled work. Today, what that bank manager does is sits at a computer, puts in some information into, a, uh, into, a, into that computer, and gets a, a decision about whether or not that person's offered a loan. And all of the um, analysis of whether or not that, that, that loan should be offered has been done, been done entirely by 
uh, an algorithm. Now, bank managers still exist in the same sorts of numbers as they did um, 20, 25 years ago, but the work has uh, clearly shifted away from, from that sort of abstract um, uh, problem solving or, 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 or creative um, uh, knowledge work to one that work that looks at far more, um, far more routine. They have a similar example involving uh, paralegals, associate professions in the legal, um, in the legal world. And that example is um, that in terms of researching or preparing a case on behalf of a, of a barrister, um, uh, a paralegal used to have to do fairly skill-intensive um, research work, go through uh, precedents and assemble all that information into a, to a way that can be used um, by someone in court. Today that work is done by a machine that can scan all precedents, can search for um, uh, relevant keywords, and can even compile those, those cases into a format that uh, is very easily uh, printed out of a machine and handed straight to the, the barrister. So the job of the, the paralegal in many cases is more put in some search terms and get an output um, as a result. Um, and so both those cases, uh, that job still exists, there's still an occupation as background, there's still an occupation as a paralegal, but the, the work is far more routine, and that is, that's kind of um, been generated by um, technological advances. And there's a little evidence to suggest that looking across Europe, um, that, that, that has been uh, the case. Um, taking data from um, the European Working Conditions Survey, uh, Bissello and uh, Martinez uh, Macias um, look at two measures of whether a job is routine, whether a job has um, high or low levels of repetitiveness, and whether a job is um, um, uh, typified by having high or low levels of standardization. And uh, in almost all countries, um, the, uh, there is a decline in the sorts of jobs that um, have been typically um, repetitive or standardized. That's the same sort of principle I was talking about. Uh, before technology replaces those sorts of jobs um, faster. And in, in uh, this table, the column not in each of those the two sides um, is picking up that, that shift away from jobs that have typically had more uh, repetitiveness or, or being rated to standardize. Um, however, the actual reported change in the amount of repetitiveness or standardization across Europe as a whole has increased. And that's saying that within the jobs that are left after this, this shift in composition, those ones that have been typically less repetitive in the past are now more repetitive and are more likely to be standardized. Um, and there's a lot of variation across different countries. So this, the top line there is an EU average. Um, and places like apparently Luxembourg is particularly bad for this. Um, uh, whereas the UK, um, which is, um, <laughs> let's see if this works. There we are. Uh, that line there um, has overall seen a fall in the level of, of repetitiveness and a very small increase in the level of standardization. Um, um, uh, as compared to lots of the, uh, of the European countries. Um, but the, the average has been towards more routine work, even if the sort of occupations that exist have typically not been associated with, um, with routineness. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to come back to a few of those points um, a little later on. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit now is what we have observed the last uh, 20, 25 years in terms of the way changes in the sort of occupations people do have related to uh, changes in, uh, in pay. And um, the UK is not untypical in these sorts of patterns, although that's what I'm going to focus on for this, this next, uh, next part. Um, earnings inequality, the distribution of wages, widened um, in the UK during the 1980s. Um, but it's plateaued um, pretty much from the 1990s until at least uh, 2007, 2008. I say that because um, if you analyze the data beyond 2000, 2008, you get different results depending on whether or not you look at one data set versus um, another. Um, and data sets that I find more useful for the sort of work I'm about to talk about, um, I think are less reliable for reporting um, this sort of earnings pattern uh, beyond 2007, 2008. Whereas a big administrative data sets that capture these wages um, effects really well, um, would tend to suggest, uh, uh, that, again, earnings inequality hasn't widened a huge amount since 2000, 2008, but I can't use it for the sort of analysis I'm about to do because of the, um, some of the um, variables that are available in the data set. So, sorry, a slightly technical, uh, uninteresting point. But it's, it's, it's fairly um, um, clear from any data set we, we might look at that between the mid-90s and 2007, 2008, there's not been a widening in, in earnings inequality. And yet the sorts of jobs that people have been doing have been shifting away from these typically middle-paying, middle-skill occupations towards 
and higher skill um, um, managerial, professional, and, and intermediate occupations. Um, this table here just reports uh, the share of people found in low paid jobs, which are defined as those earning two thirds below the, the median salary, um, the median hourly wage, and high paid jobs, those earning over 150% of the median, um, so over three over two. Um, and between the, the 80s and um, uh, the early 2000s, um, which one data set allows me to, to compare against, that group, uh, the high pay and low pay has clearly grown. Um, but it really only grew until the start of the 1990s. And if you compare between 1994 and 2007, the, the low pay group has shrunk ever so slightly. The high pay group has barely grown at all. So the middle paying group has to be um, ever so slightly larger, but essentially has, has stayed the same. So that's, that's the same as saying that earnings and equality hasn't, hasn't widened. Those two things should go together. One thing that has changed ever, ever so slightly, um, at least in terms of levels, is the amount of people in the very high paying group. So these are people who have ha um, hourly salaries more than three times um, the medium. And that has continued to grow over this, um, over this time period, even if those that are generally high paid uh, isn't, uh, in, fact, in fact, much larger. Um, so why might that might be the case? Um, well, if we just um, try to understand all the things that change the distribution of earnings over time, we have two broad categories. We have that the labor market at one point in time, let's say the early 90s, and labor market another point in time, let's say 2007, 2008, um, in terms of the characteristics of the people doing jobs uh, are very different um, today rather than um, uh, in the past. People are more educated, people are typically doing um, managerial, professional, intermediate, or um, lower skilled service work as compared to their counterparts uh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so if we were to just say, well, whatever characteristics um, uh, have changed, um, we allow that to, that to, to, that to occur, but um, suppose that the way those sorts of characteristics corresponded to pay stayed the same between 1994 and 2007, 2000. A widening inequality. Uh, that people have shifted towards higher skilled um, uh, occupations and lower skilled occupations that have typically been associated with higher and lower pay. That should widen inequality. That people have moved towards being more educated. Um, and that the more educated group typically has a wider range of earnings, that should widen inequality. Uh, that people are um, less likely to be a member of the union. And union membership was typically associated with low middle um, uh, levels of, of, of pay. No longer being in a union, uh, experiencing the, the high pay that unions tend to generate, that should have an impact on inequality. So all these compositional changes taken on their own should have, should have risen, uh, increased the amount of inequality and increased the amount of people at the high end and low end of the distribution. So what's happened? Um, that has meant that, that hasn't that hasn't taken place. That people are still largely located around the middle of the distribution. Well, the um, the relationship between those characteristics, occupation, education, union membership, um, uh, other demographic trends, um, have shifted in such a way that have have pulled back on some of that um, that, that that push towards um, higher inequality. In particular, the rewards to having a degree or any high level qualification, or the rewards to being in a, an occupation that is typically uh, paid, uh, um, paid more than, than, than average, being in a higher skilled occupation, um, are not as great overall as uh, they might have been um, um, 15, 20 years ago. But as more people have moved into those groups, the sorts of jobs being created are at the lower end of, of what we might have previously expected. So more managers, but typically lower pay managers. More people who have degrees, but typically um, as that group has grown, that the graduate premium is, has, has, has been at the lower, um, lower end. And to illustrate that last point, I'm trying to break down the, 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 the rewards to having a degree over different parts of the, the distribution. Um, so whatever the, the benefit to having a degree was, uh, depending on where we ended up in the, in the labor market uh, historically, um, these people here are earning 3 or 4% less than they might have expected to if they just joined the degree holding group and be rewarded um, in a similar way to, to, to that cohort in, in that particular year. So that's another way of saying that across um, certain parts of distribution, um, the rewards having qualifications are, are falling, um, that um, uh, the, the, the spread of returns to having uh, high qualifications is getting lower. And a consequence of that is that um, if we were to look at the, um, uh, where jobs have grown and shrunk um, by people at different levels of qualification, well, um, this group here, middle-paying jobs, which are in the 
professional managerial intermediate category um, held by graduates. So we have a growing number of people doing professional jobs and intermediate technical jobs and some managerial jobs who have high levels of qualifications who are now earning uh, in this middle part of the distribution and sort of filling in the gap where people who are doing sort of routine manual jobs and routine clerical jobs have disappeared. So we just have a, a kind of a new, um, a new middle of, 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 of work. Um, and and uh, that goes along with this, this falling um, return to having um, uh, a high level qualification and a widening in what is actually meant by a manager, by meant by a professional type work and by meant by technical uh, type of work to, to, to spread across that distribution more, more broadly. Um, what are some of the examples of these, these sort of new middle jobs? Well, we've got different sorts of, uh, different sorts of categories. Um, what I want to show on this, in this chart is the reasons why they appear in the middle, uh, middle um, group. So, um, in part, it might be that some occupations were typically always at the lower end of um, pay, even within managerial work or professional work. And that as those occupations have grown, that's had a knock-on effect on, on uh, the amount that are appearing around the middle of the distribution. This is a consequence of um, a quite a diverse range of, uh, of individuals um, and, and pay for a particular occupation um, uh, growing altogether. So that's been captured by the blue bars, just to do with the, the shift towards that sort of work. The, the red uh, bar um, uh, here is capturing the way that an occupation has shifted towards having more middle paid versions of that particular occupation. So that's particularly extreme in the case of, uh, case of uh, teaching professionals um, whose pay is um, much more likely to be in the middle part of the distribution than the, than the high part of the distribution as compared to uh, the, the mid-90s, so that's one of the drivers of this, this middle group for that reason. Whereas something like managers in distribution, storage and retail um, have always been um, more likely to be near the middle, um, but it's just that group has grown quite a lot and, and filled up that, that, particular, that particular gap. Um, now, linking some of that to, to what I said earlier about the way the sorts of jobs people do might change over time, one possibility is that these occupations we're talking about here um, are ones that are in some way becoming more routine, maybe in some way becoming more um, um, de-skilled, and um, uh, that's why they're sort of shifting more towards the middle. Um, and that change over time is, is changing the nature of the job in a way that sort of leads to them now being more like middle-paying jobs than the high-paying jobs that people expect in the past, and having a consequent knock-on effect on the sorts of skills um, necessary. To try and understand that a little bit more, I um, looked at some data uh, from uh, the UK Workplace Employment Relations Survey, which has a bunch of questions on how much influence and discretion people have in their job. And I combine all that information together to get an indicator of, of kind of autonomy within work, influence or discretion in work, or another way of capturing the extent to which the job is routine or not routine. Um, now, this is something that typically is, is it's higher for, for graduates versus non-graduates, which we would expect, that graduates typically do um, um, less um, routine uh, work and um, have more influence or autonomy in their jobs. Um, and that's particularly the case when they are matched into occupations that require high level skills. So the difference between the, um, the blue and the red bar here is taking a graduate um, who might be in a high skill job, like being a, a manager or a um, a professional compared to a graduate who's ended up in something more like a, um, um, a middle skill occupation or, or, or even lower skill than that. Um, so influence and autonomy and, and um, routineness uh, and non-routineness is associated with skilled work and, and those skills being used in the workplace. Um, and in keeping with the, the European data that I had shown before, uh, this measure seems to be increasing over time. It's increasing for both skilled and uh, for, for highly qualified and, and less qualified uh, individuals. Um, so. Um, uh, this is the data from 1998 and 2004 and 2011, and overall, the labour market is showing increasing the amounts of uh, influence that, that workers have. It's still possible that the occupations that are more located towards the middle could be um, could be uh, different to, to this overall this overall pattern. Um, and last point to say here is that this influence measure is quite correlated with being in a middle wage occupation in the first place. So it seems to capture something about the story about these routine, more routine jobs being um, um, middle wage. So the more um, influence or uh, autonomy a person has on their job, the less uh, non-routine a job is, um, the less likely it is to be a middle-paying uh, middle job. Um, well, we wanted to find out about whether or not actually something changed within the job's level of influence, levels of, levels of, of, of um, 
uh, routineness and whether it had impact on whether or not it was likely to be more likely to be uh, middle paid. And it turns out that, that wasn't the case, that these jobs that were growing in the middle were not becoming more routine. Um, um, what was happening is that the jobs in the middle were becoming the sorts of jobs that someone might be going in with high level qualifications and be more likely to be disappointed about the, uh, the, the use of their, their skills. Um, and um, that suggests a shift perhaps towards um, other forms of non-routine work, but not highly demanding uh, non-routine uh, non um, uh, works. Maybe more face-to-face -face personal service type, uh, type, type, of, uh, type of tasks that someone who has highly developed skills in, say, university would find was, were being um, underutilized. Um, are there some occupations that are becoming more routine over time? Well, yes, there are. There's, there's a small number. And some of them line up with examples I've already given. So legal associate professionals and paralegals. And also uh, um, legal professionals are occupations where the amount of influence that people doing these jobs um, it has declined between 2004 and 2000, and uh, that should read 11. Um, other professionals, like science professionals, will also say the same. These are the highest paying types of administrative occupations that, that, that exist. So while they are not the typical high school occupations, they, they have lots of um, similarities with high school occupations, certainly in terms of uh, terms of pay. And these jobs are becoming more, more routine. And um, um, some of the occupations within the healthcare sector. So health associate professionals includes things like nurses, therapists, and uh, here um, health social service managers, uh, all exhibiting some declining levels of of autonomy in their job or um, increases in, in the amounts of uh, routineness of their work. Um, okay, one last thing we can look at in this, in this data is whether or not um, firms and employers are having some impact on, on the amount of uh, routineness or um, autonomy individuals have in their, in their work that they might pass on to, to the way that they are paid and the, and the skill that they need in their, in their jobs. Um, and there are a variety of different ways in which um, managers report that they um, have um, impacted uh, the workplace and the work of their uh, employees from in introducing new technologies to changing about the way work is organized or introducing some more new technique or some other sort of uh, initiative. Um, and what we find is that places that have introduced new technologies in of itself don't really have any impact on, on um, um, whether or not a job is more or less routine. The new technology itself isn't, isn't, isn't changing the nature of work. What does change the nature of work is uh, arrangements around, uh, or practices around managing working time, and practices around um, introducing new work techniques. These have systematically reduced the amount of um, discretion individuals have in their, uh, in, in their, um, in their jobs, and made their, made their work um, quite less discretion over time. Um, New technology has uh, improved the amount of discretion and, the, and, and make shift to will jobs be more non-routine, uh, particularly for, for managers on their on their own, um, uh, but not not more not more broadly. Um, okay, so that's um, sort of run through um, a few things that are happening or have happened recently to uh, the sort of jobs that people have done in the UK and. Um, what, I, what I'm arguing here is that uh, in, recent, um, in recent years, the many jobs that have grown in occupational groups that we think of as being uh, higher paid um, have not been paid um, um, particularly highly. But that isn't necessarily because these jobs have become more uh, routine in the way that Brown, Lauder, and uh, Ashton were thinking um, in that it's sort of the process gets more, more tailorized. But it does suggest that um, um, the sorts of jobs people are doing are not particularly um, demanding uh, of, of high-level skills. As a result, these people tend to report that they are um, uh, underutilized or, or overskilled for their um, for their jobs. And then it's not the surprise necessarily that they end up being um, kind of middle-paid, uh, whereas historically you might expect people with those same sort of occupations to be far higher paid. Um, now, what does this what does this imply for the future? Um, it's, I'm going to say a, a number of, of different things. The first is that in some areas where we think jobs are likely to grow, where there is a complementarity with technologies that exist, investments in certain sorts of skills are likely to have an impact on the distribution of, of, of earnings. And those are investments that, that should be um, found and, um, and made. Um, one thing that might be different about the labor market, uh, even for high-skilled work in uh, the future, is 
that the riskiness of any separate skill investment could be larger. Um, so even for people with high level uh, uh, skills, um, there is uh, a possibility um, that they don't get rewarded um, uh, in, a, in, in a very equal um, way. And um, an explanation from that is that some of the skills in that, that particularly complement really strongly with um, new digital technologies create sort of um, superstar markets or um, winner-takes-all markets. Um, so examples people have pointed to in the past include things like developing a, having the right skills to develop a particular platform um, that everybody who uses the internet for do that particular function ends up using. So the, the, the amount of people that were, that were behind developing the Instagram platform is a fairly small number. And some people had some skills that allowed them to, to develop that particular software and platform. Because digital technology can be very easily replicated, costlessly replicated, and because there are some um, benefits to being part of the same network, um, the only platform anyone wants to use for sharing photos is Instagram. And therefore, the only market, the only sort of market player that ends up resulting is Instagram. And all the rewards to, to having that particular um, idea, creating that particular platform or, or that particular solution, end up going to a fairly small number of people. There might be only a few people who had similar sorts of skills who might have come up with uh, a platform that is almost as good. And in um, uh, previous times, when um, uh, some um, skills can be used to produce um, a good um, that couldn't be replicated costlessly, they could also be put to work. If you produce the second best toaster, there was still a market for your toaster, even though there was uh, uh, a better toaster out there because the manufacturer of the better toaster couldn't make all the best toasters. Um, and there's a limit to how big um, that, that exercise could be. In, in these areas where these, these, the, the product of these skills um, can be replicated relatively costlessly, um, that's not necessarily the case, that you end up with one main player. You end up with um, the, uh, I think about this in my field, the, the single lecturer in the entire country who can give the best lecture in um, inequality. And as we can replicate that lecture across um, all students, across all universities, because we now have good video um, technology and good audio technology and um, internet connections that are fast enough to share large files, why would there need to be a second person giving lectures in inequality when one person is, 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 is the best at that? Um, so this one would be one superstar in that case, and then everyone else would be, um, uh, who might have comparable, slightly lesser uh, abilities in that area, um, uh, somewhat losing out. So th there's an implication for distribution earnings there, even for um, highly sought after skills. Um, the other implication, I think, of what I'm saying is that there should be no um, assumption that the demand for skill labor, um, even if we're not looking at um, kind of widespread job losses, will continue to, 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 to grow. Um, that in many cases so far, um, the availability of highly skilled um, labor has um, found constraints on the sort of work it might do that has led to um, such workers being uh, underutilized in the job market. And there's no real reason to suppose that just because some skills exist is going to be some way they can be, can be um, put to use. And it could be in many firms' interest to not necessarily create jobs that use all those sorts of, of skills. It could be that the algorithm that allocates um, loans uh, with a bank manager pressing a button and inputting a little bit of data is far more efficient and makes far fewer mistakes than that um, bank manager used to make in the past, um, even if the the sorts of wages that go along with that, um, person who's now offering that are, are lower and that work is um, uh, far less skillful and, and, and other consequences, of, uh, and consequences um, of that. So there's an important constraint in there and, and just focusing on, on boosting uh, high level skills, having more people go to university, more people participate in high level vocational qualifications, whatever that might be, um, is not gonna be enough on its own. There's been no assumption that, that um, highly skilled work will, will necessarily result. And then before we get more and more people who will look more like um, um, the middle group as before and a few people um, shifting further away. Um, I think what that makes me think about is that skill supply, uh, people coming out of an education system or training system, and its later demand and needs to be considered in a joined up way. And that's for any government, as I think this government, current government um, is positioning itself, that is expressing some form of renewed interest in industrial policy needs to address. And you need to be thinking about the sort of sectors that, like, that, that, that uh, are going to be required, uh, the sort of skills that might go along with that, the sort of sectors that actually we would like to have in a, uh, in a maybe a more equal or 
uh, high productivity, high wage uh, economy, and be matching that up with the sorts of investments people are, are making, rather than the system that I think we, we, we have now, which is one where skills um, requirements are developed by employers and in industry, and skill supplies developed by um, uh, students and by the education sector, and the interaction between the two is fairly fairly uh, limited, and therefore it's not surprising that we get high levels of um, mismatch across lots of different countries. So these bars represent the proportion of graduates who claim that they are uh, in jobs which do not fully demand all the skills and the capabilities that they, they have. Um, and um, it's perfectly possible that a graph like this can live alongside a graph that says that employers are not satisfied with the sorts of skills that are uh, coming out of universities. You can have people be overqualified and have more skills available and uh, employees be unsatisfied if there's a difference in the sorts of skills that are being produced. And that, I think, again, is, is, a, is a consequence of um, um, uh, a lack of coordination between what jobs are going to exist, what skills are required, what jobs could be created if more skills were, were or more of the right skills were available, and what people actually are able to do. So five last two uh, things about um, some other areas for skills policy to, to consider, and then um, happy to take some questions. Um, part of this is venturing into territory that I, um, I could understand a little bit, but, but I'm, I'm not so claiming any form of expertise. The first is that I think it's, it'd be fairly controversial to claim that developing ICT skills in a, in a sort of general, general generic way across the, the population um, is, is likely to be a good investment, that many things are going to require um, competence using um, computers and being able to interact with, as this measure captures here, problem-solving type situations using, using ICT technology. Um, this is data from PIAC, which doesn't really have a time series. Um, so it's hard to say kind of how countries have been developing um, um, over, over, uh, over time. But one way of trying to get a sense of that is to look at different age groups in this data. Uh, in terms of how well they scored on this internationally comparable test of ICT type skills. And, well, first thing is that typically younger people are better equipped with ICT skills than older, older people. Uh, even older people that might have been in the workforce and have some experience around that. So they, they have you know, some different, different ways of developing uh, relevant skills in some, in some areas. The second thing to observe is that country trajectories around this are, are massively uh, different. Um, the line that starts here and finishes up here so the biggest difference between older workers and younger workers, that's Korea. And Korea has gone from a country where the majority of the workforce was not very competent, uh, and we, we suppose that was also true when these people were younger as well, to being uh, the, the leader in um, competence with ICT. Uh, this line, let me get this right way around, that line there is uh, the United States. So having started sort of grouped together with lots of other richer countries, it's now fallen way behind, um, and is now comparable to uh, this line here, which, is, uh, is that on Poland? Uh, good question. Um, one of these two is Poland. I think actually the darker purple line is, uh, dark purple line is, is Poland. Uh, the UK is this line here, which is also a sort of purple. Um, one of these the lower lines down here is Ireland. So gaps have, have developed in between different sorts of countries. And um, even in a crude way of comparing these, these outcomes with um, some broad measures of what investments might be, might be useful. It's not obvious why that might be the case. So, for example, um, the amount of computers to student in Korea is um, far lower than in the US and the UK. So it's not necessarily about resources. The amount of um, teachers reporting they have insufficient ICT skills in Sweden is higher than it is in the UK, and yet Sweden's all the way up here. Um, I suppose that one might speak to how demanding an ICT curriculum students might uh, have and how whether, how, uh, whether teachers feel that they are able to... Um, um, develop it, so I guess there's, there's two sides of that. Um, but there certainly some improvements on, on these sorts of outcomes. This is not the sort of thing that the UK and the US would, would, would like to continue into future generations if they're going to be competitive and find a suitable work for, for um, uh, subsequent generations. Um, and the last couple of points I want to make is um, that investment in skills, particularly in early years of education, that help deal with greater career disruption are likely to be um, uh, uh, valuable and um, productive investments. Um, that if we're not entirely sure what jobs are um, going to be automated now in 10 years' time or 15, 20 years' time, then it is likely that anyone might make a, a particular investment and need to move around to a completely different career within their working life in a way that's not been true 
um, for uh, previous uh, generations. So in part, that reflects the usual claims around having general um, and transferable skills like literacy and numeracy and all things that governments have um, long-term aims to, to improve. That also suggests that there are uh, non-cognitive or soft skills that could um, um, be beneficial for um, developing further in, in young people. So things around coping would, would be um, necessary. People have much more disrupted uh, careers or face much greater risks. Um, things like leadership and creativity and having social, emotional competencies are also um, uh, likely to pay off in, in this world. And the evidence that's available suggests that early career, childhood investments in these sorts of skills um, has some long run payoffs in terms of development of, of, uh, of other things like literacy, numeracy, and, and, and more technical skills. Um, and that there are remedial investments that can be made to help raise these levels for, say, um, uh, younger adults. Um, in a way that remedial investments in technical cognitive skills tend not to be quite so successful. So those are things that, that could be looked at. But in all these cases, I don't think it should be assumed, and my reading of literature is, is that um, these things are uh, always able to be increased. So there are things that can be taught um, to help people improve, uh, improve with stressful situations and learn coping techniques. Uh, there might be things people can learn around leadership. Whether or not something like creativity is, is, is taught um, or can be uh, easily improved across a wide number of students um, within the classroom, I think, is a, is, is a different issue. And those, for any of those investments you might think about, that needs to be um, borne in mind. OK, that's where I'd like to finish. I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, thank you. Is it not working? Okay, fine. Fine, I will absolutely do it. I think there are microphones here, so Barra. Um... Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I know, at, at least in the States where I'm from, there is a growing epidemic of a quarter life crisis. Um, okay. deemed by some where college graduates are graduating and finding unfulfilling work, if work at all, and um, there's a lot of context in the, you know, like, what, what am I doing with my life kind of question. Okay. Given the background context that you just described in the labor field, what advice would you give to those 20-somethings who are looking to, you know, be a responsible adult financially um, and, and pursue work that actually is meaningful to them? Having already, um, having already got to the point of investing in education and now looking around for... Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, because if that question were about what advice would I give to a 16-year-old, well, um, it's perfectly possible that um, they might end up as one of these sorts of people later on, that there aren't necessarily enough high-skilled jobs to go around for everybody who might be investing in that. And yet, it's still completely individually rational to make that sort of investment because it's your only chance of, of securing quite a lot of them. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for what would happen, what happens beyond that sort of, um, that sort of point. The people are constrained by the labor markets in which they, um, they operate. And I think the impression is often given that if you just make the right investments, that the, all the opportunities will open up for you. Well, I, I guess for one individual, holding everyone else constant, then that's probably, that's probably true. If you make yourself uh, equipped with, with certain sorts of skills, then you make yourself a more valuable um, uh, potential employee in the future. Probably everyone is engaged with this game, and therefore there's a certain zero-sum element to it. That means that people are going to continue to lose out and exert more and more resources in, in sort of chasing that. That, I think, this is why this is a policy issue. This is why this is a, an issue for... Governments, I think, not so much, not just about encouraging people into more and more education, which um, uh, they continue to still do, but to ensure that the sorts of opportunities that, that those people can then do exist and exist in high numbers. And there are less good levers for doing that than on the skill supply side. Um, but there, there still exists levers. There exists ways of facilitating collaboration between companies that enables them to create more and more high school jobs. There also exists a channel by which the state itself is a very large employer and can help create lots of jobs itself. So the, those are areas in which the, 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 the demand side for, for that could, um, could be improved. I mean, beyond that, if, 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 if alongside this, they're also worrying that actually any investment I might make is likely to be 
um, um, not pay off massively because maybe in 10 years' time that job's going to disappear, then I think that's a, re that's a potential realistic concern. I'm not sure there's, there's good advice to offer there because everyone's facing that same sorts of risk. And those more general, generic, transferable types of um, skills and uh, investments would be, the, I suppose, the best thing that the, that the person could, could do at that point uh, to allow themselves to look like the sort of individual who, entering in a new occupation, even without little experience, they, um, uh, they could fit easily into that, into that, new, uh, that new business or that new firm or organisation. And um, they respond well to training and, 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 and learn new capabilities quite quickly. So those, those, those sorts of um, things might be helpful. Hi, um, just to follow up thought, I mean, a lot of gradual kids always come out of school and take a while, they have to do internships, right? So that, that hasn't changed. Maybe the amount of internships they have to do might increase. Um, it, just, just to get my, my head wrapped around uh, some of the main threads of what you said, um, it sounds like basically what 100 years ago, you know, what were already sort of repetitive standardized jobs as technology improved, um, the amount of human labor working on them versus com mechanical labor uh, decreased. And then eventually you just have one highly skilled person or two highly skilled people looking over machinery uh, and then making quick decisions and then maybe one or two less skilled assistants. Yeah. And it sounds like that that's just basically repeating itself within a, uh, what is now typically considered middle class or middle, middle pay jobs. Yeah. And so in other words, the job's never gonna disappear, but they'll, they'll reshape themselves. And so it seems like that trend will basically, you know, so it's like jobs won't disappear, but they'll completely shift into higher, higher education, but just for a few people. And then as you say, the, those are what's gonna become middle income. Um, and then the other, Thing that I'm that you weren't talking about, but what I am sort of hearing around this space is a continual learning process. So you're basically like to respond to that. Like at any point in your career, you have to continually learn. Basically, you can't just stop, finish your education, and then expect to work for the next 35 years. You have to take courses going forward. Um, with all that in mind, and what you're saying, are you seeing people? Are you seeing businesses or, or universities and, and governments in different countries uh, trying to respond in more innovative ways, um, either introducing or suggesting a basic universal income or uh, trying to adapt uh, educational uh, practices from university or even secondary school to respond to that? Okay. Um, if I take that question, then... And then was, okay, so on, on the first point, I think that's that's generally the pattern that as technology improves, the things that it substitutes for and complements with also changes over over time. So you get to the point where um, a few people might be um, working alongside new technology that is largely doing the work of people. I think that, that, that's absolutely correct. Now, what the the, the, the challenge to imagine is what happens to those people that were previously doing that those, those jobs and what new jobs might exist, uh, to, 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 um, what the, uh, occupations might exist to expand sufficiently to, to take those people in. And in this, um, in this last sort of 10-year period, um, one of the concerns has been that while I can put up a table from that LinkedIn data putting all these job tables, that, some of which I don't understand, but people are doing in fairly large numbers, that that isn't sufficient to, to fill the gaps of um, large number of people displaced from the sort of work that is being created by technology. A more, uh, I guess, a less anecdotal way of, of looking at that is within any of 10 years, the classification of industries and occupations is updated and new things are added that, that just would need, not need to be counted 10 years before. And in some work by Frey and, Oz, uh, Frey and Berger um, um, last year, um, in the 1980s, these new industries accounted for a kind of 8% of um, uh, new uh, of, of employment, so things that just didn't exist at start of the 80s were what people were doing in the 1990s. Um, in the, at the end of the 2000s, that figure was 0.5%, so there was, wasn't the same sort of growth in that, that same decade. And, and who knows, maybe that's a, a lull and there's, there's something else that comes beyond that point. 
Um, I suspect that, that there is um, uh, future jobs to, to be created that are likely to expand. Uh, I don't also necessarily anticipate that all those jobs would be highly skilled. So um, the, the last thing that I would imagine could be easily replaced by technology is a sort of personal interaction um, uh, functions that, that, that people seek in their, in their lives. So absent of anything else, that's a, those are roles that might, people might, might fulfill. Um, given that high competition, if there aren't as a sort of um, source of work, that might mean fairly low wages in, in those, those sorts of areas. Um, what sort of policy responses have, have we seen that are particularly innovative? Um, part of this is going to be my ignorance, but nothing particularly jumps to mind. Um, there are certainly discussions around things like <coughs> universal basic um, income as a way of dealing with, um, well, uh, in one part, the, the, the growing spread of, um, uh, of earnings that, that, that might result or growing one in, in inequality in the part dealing with the fact that people are more likely to be out of work and at risk of, of losing and having to transfer particular sorts of, sorts of jobs. But I see that discussion outside of policy for the most part. I don't, I don't think that's what, what governments are doing. I think that's being championed by, by other sorts of groups. Um, equally, if I think particularly about the UK context, I can't think of anything um, all that in innovative about um, uh, ongoing personal learning. There may be people in this, in this room or elsewhere that could, could point to all sorts of wonderful um, new programs that are, that are helping people continue to learn new skills throughout the course of their life. Um, there is a lot of talk around um, online education, and I think there are areas in which that could be um, very helpful, that it helps reduce costs and, and spread, but I think I have a, a concern about the quality and the level of skills that can be imparted by, uh, by that. So uh, there might be certain things that suits very well, but um, a high level of vocational skills, I, I'm, I'm not clear how that would necessarily work, I'm not clear how that would work in any situation in the sort of traditional way that those sort of things are, um, uh, are taught. So no, I don't, I don't have any particularly um, really good examples. I think they're all part of a joined up thinking around, around this, around the way people can help to develop skills over time, uh, around people who are, who are older who find themselves displaced from work because of technological disruption um, can find, and this is, this is an ongoing challenge, this is, not, this is nothing new, um, people whose work careers are disrupted in late 40s and 50s find that, that, that particularly challenging and um, um, it can be difficult to find the, the right sorts of investments to, to, to get people back into work at that, uh, at that particular case. Uh, hello. Um, I'm uh, something that I didn't see in your lecture was a reference to the the word numeracy. I don't know whether I may have missed it, but um, we, you know, technology really has uh, effectively the technology has made it much easier uh, for um, people to acquire skills but at the same time, much more difficult to acquire numeracy skills because who's going to go through the whole process of rote learning if a, a screen will actually do it for you? And I think that um, most industry or middle, middle range jobs uh, are based upon um, numerical counting and exchange and processes of that sort. And of course, the machine does this so much better um, and I think as a result of that, we see that I've been a mature student at uh, Oxford Colleges for several years, um, and I've been just absolutely astonished at how poor numeracy uh, is amongst people of high education. I mean, I find it amazing that uh, I can, listening to a lecture, do a minor calculation in my head um, and know what the proportional percentage or <laughs> addition figure is, and people look at me with astonishment because I've already got the answer. Uh, they struggle with their calculators, they use their mobile phones or their laptop screens, and even then they can't get the answer. So, you know, it's no surprise to read in the paper in the last two, three days that places like Singapore, South Korea, and Asiatic countries are miles ahead of the Western world in terms of numeracy. And I think numeracy, actually, if you haven't got it, it sabotages your other skills. People don't wait to find out how clever you are good at this. You can't add up. And I'm afraid that's it. And it should be, you know, it should be greater emphasis in training and teaching on basic numeracy. 
I mean, absolutely don't disagree with that. Uh, I think the same PIAC data that I was pointing out on ICT skills indicates the UK's relatively poor position in uh, international comparisons of, of numeracy. Uh, I think we had the great honour of being the only um, the only country where the most recent cohort did worse than um, some of the older cohorts, whereas in most of the countries there was uh, there was an improvement across different different sorts of um, sorts of cohorts. And the developments in numeracy, literacy, and technical problem solving, ICT skills all go together. And those are the sort of general generic skills that that um, it's impossible to argue would not be beneficial to uh, to boost. Um, my reading of some of the literature is that these are investments that are best targeted early in life and that remedial investments in this are, are very, very difficult and very, very costly for some payoff, but, but there is a, a cost-benefit analysis there. So if resources are going to be targeted on this, then there's a particular time where they should be targeted. And why I think it would be excellent if all apprenticeship courses that people might be entering have a literary and numeracy component and took people's maths and English and science skills to a higher um, to higher levels that might not um, have the same sort of uh, sort of payoff as if that same money was invested in in, in sort of former early years um, education. Um, there might be some jobs for which numeracy becomes less uh, necessary than than it than it is today uh, because we have this new technology that does, does that for us. However, um, um, I think as as a as keeping a, a range of broad skills available to people for whatever new jobs might be created, what skills might be required literary numeracy, problem solving, ICT skills complement more specific high level skills in that way and, and absolutely, yeah, I would agree with that. So it seems like, well, diving into the automation literature began with an attempt to codify components of jobs into tasks that were automatable. And then now a renewed focus is on skills because that codification didn't capture everything we wanted to capture about a job but it still appears extremely useful to have a taxonomy about tasks that could be automated. Yeah. I'm curious if you've, exper or if you've, if you've um, found anything about potentially developing future taxonomies about tasks in jobs so that we can identify um, or have a way of identifying mm. what is automated. Um, so I, I, mean, I think that's, that's broadly correct. And, and bringing back in skills here is, is, is a way of thinking, talking about particular policy issues. However, I think the focus on tasks and the bundle of tasks that go into an occupation is is the right one. That there isn't skilled work or most skilled work. There isn't routine or non-routine work. There's a series of tasks that we bundle them together. Things that we call um, occupations. The problem is that these classifications, all these taxonomies, are fairly static over time. That what we thought of as being a routine job in most analysis around this um, is the same in the 1980s as it is in the 2000s, and that's. That's, I guess, what we're starting to question here, that the, something that we thought of as being routine, uh, as being non-routine 20, 30 years ago, is actually routine now uh, because we've got better machines that can, can deal with what people were doing beforehand as if it were a set of, set of, um, set of instructions. Um, so I mean, so one, one would be to have much more frequent evaluations of the sorts of things people do in their jobs to get that sense. The problem is that's incredibly um, uh, costly and takes a lot of time. Um, a lot of times do, and there are there are um, ways of trying to supplement that that data, looking at some more frequent um, um, survey, labour market survey evidence on um, sorts of jobs people, sort of tasks people are doing with occupations to see whether what we thought of ten years ago as being a this what this occupation means is is, is still the case. Uh, but I think these things are changing quickly over time, and then there is a greater payoff to having a better um, understanding, having better data uh, on that, and those, and those sorts of investments, while costly, would be would be worthwhile. Right. Um, do we still have a couple of questions? Otherwise, well, there's yep, quite a few more. Then let's take a few more minutes. Um, sure, maybe absolutely fine. Slightly short answer, then we can continue also course. outside. Yep. Um, Clara, do you want to? Yep. OK. So one, two, three, four. OK, so, uh, so my question is about uh, taking uh, humans out of, the, uh, out of the, op the production loop within companies, um, so effectively transforming profit centers into cost centers uh, as um, for example, uh, about a decade ago, I, I worked in a large uh, trading desk in New York in which there was a team of uh, ICT trained professionals who, uh, whose job was to uh, transform this trading desk of, uh, filled with uh, traders, trading professionals with uh, effectively an, an automation uh, of, their, uh, of their roles. And the people who were doing this were effectively a cost center, replacing the 
the trading teams who were a profit center before. So the profit center to the firm will continue to exist, uh, but, the, uh, but the, the human operators making it work will be in a different kind of position with respect to the, 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 the uh, production units and, and, the, uh, and the revenues, um, uh, point for point. Uh, do, you, do you think that, this, that there's a pattern in this, first of all? And uh, how do you think that this might impact the negotiating power of, uh, of workers in general uh, relative to capital? Um, so on the first part, um, that's not the way I've thought about it before, but I, I guess that, that, that's right, that where we see um, new uh, technologies becoming available, it requires someone who can find a way to, to make that work in a particular organization. Um, so the, the people who are um, involved in designing new automated process or maybe maintaining that at some point down um, um, down the, the, the line. So I mean, any job that is directly linked to the implementation of new technology or, or its maintenance, um, and whether that might be high skill or lower skill, is, is um, um, almost certainly a growth occupation by, by, by definition. But I, I hadn't thought about it. I guess I think of it as, as being adding value to the company, but through, right. I guess, outside of the core operation of the, of the it's organization. A it's a growth occupation, but uh, it's a growth occupation, but the question is, is whether that occupation has the same role relative to the company's um, revenues as it would have before. So uh, before where a, um, a one, one trader generates one P&L on, on his book and in the future it's a computer that gets developed and maintained by others. If the trader leaves the firm, he takes his clients with him. But if, uh, if a developer leaves the firm, they uh, basically the, the firm continues to operate and just needs to another plug-in developer to, to, uh, to take over that role. Uh, that was, that makes sense. So, so, I mean, one, I guess, part answer to your second question would be the extent to which those sorts of roles become core to a firm, need to be somewhat internalized, and it's important that firms have those as, as, as central workers that, that are sort of outside of the um, competitive labor market, or whether they operate with those people are more arm's length contractual or um, freelance type of uh, type arrangements. I can imagine situations in both case, and in uh, in the former, um, that would at least improve the standing of labor. Uh, but for wages in the latter, um, maybe that's that's a situation where there's going to be greater and greater competition and uh, lead to, to, to lower wages. Um, that's probably a, a partial answer to, to that much bigger question you're asking at the end. Thank you. Um, I have a question actually about the data and your occupational categories. Yep. I should explain I work on developing countries where this is really a sticky issue and you're never really sure if it's reflecting reality. Yep. And that's basically what I'm wondering in your data. If you could say a bit more about it and how these occupational categories are arrived at. And um, I forgive me, but I got the impression it could I mean, the, the, this was all European data, presumably, um, you know, there's a standardization there that probably reflects the corporate world. But there, as we know, there's a lot of creative activity going on or ind indeed activity related to desperation of unemployment, which means that is that really being caught in the net of, you know, those figures? Um, okay, so and the first point is that um, I take the sort of available classifications as a way of, of capturing these, these jobs, and these are put together um, uh, uh, on, on semi-regular intervals as a way of, of trying to find some homogenous measure of, of some job. But I think part of the point of what I'm saying is actually uh, these are convenient ways of thinking about groups of jobs, but there is a wide variety within those jobs. Um, they might have some common properties. We recognize what a nurse looks like, we recognize what a, uh, a doctor looks like, we recognize what an engineer might look like. But um, uh, some might be higher paid, some might be lower paid, some might be involved in tasks that are more or less uh, routine. So really any occupational classification is just a starting point um, and treating all occupations within that one particular group as, as being the same has, um, has some problems that, that I'm, some of the things I'm trying to actually um, get at here. Um, on the second point, um, w while these things are updated, say, semi-regularly, semi there could be all sorts of um, new things developing. Uh, I've, I've kept away in this entire talk until this point about thinking about things to do with the gig economy or those sorts of jobs that are created by people who are, who are kind of outside traditional work structures and um, um, 
uh, my senses, although I still think maybe in part because they're not being picked up very well by this sort of data, that it's hard to know exactly how important a, a feature that's, that's, that's going, to, um, going to be. Um, and um, if we had better information, we'd want to know a lot more about, okay, what is the sort of pay that goes along with that sort of work? What sort of skills are required for those sorts of, sorts, sorts of people? And um, uh, while we can say something about the people that have, that have, have, have long existed in the labor market and recognize the sorts of skills and tasks they might be performing there, I, I would agree they, they, are, they are outside of what we um, might currently be um, um, talking about. Uh, although hopefully those things change a bit more um, over time. Hello, uh, Mira Lal. I'm a um, uh, medical uh, professional. Uh, and uh, my question uh, to you uh, with your intensive, in-depth um, uh, explanation about ICT and the implications of jobs. Uh, in the future, what would you think uh, would prevent um, biopsychosocial means physical, mental, and social um, problem, health problems from being made redundant from such job situations? I've got uh, data from the USA, Japan, India, and um, here where they have been suddenly taken off because it's no longer needed. The person who's done the uh, uh, making of uh, the person redundant gets a promotion and um, increase in the salary. And there's a lot of uh, morbidity, that is um, uh, illness, mental illness, and people who have been made redundant and have not got a job again. Yeah. Um, what would you, your suggestion regarding this? Regarding helping those people, I think that's, that would that be... Okay. Um, uh, it's hard to know what to, to, to suggest on those individual basis. I think um, that there are a range of social and health issues that I haven't talked about so far in this, in this presentation, or, or um, perhaps deliberately, um, that are a trade-off of the investment in new technologies um, for reasons of um, increasing productivity. But I have absolutely no doubt that where firms invest in new technologies, it is reflecting some sort of decision to raise their own profits, raise the output of their organizations. That might be the most efficient thing to do. Um, but there are social costs that are, not be, that are not considered by just looking purely at wages and not looking at, at, at turnover. And um, there is a trade-off within that that I don't know if we're particularly well set up to deal with, um, but there isn't really a mechanism that lets us think, actually, do we allow certain investments to take place if there are broader social issues that go, that go along with that? Um, but um, I think it's an argument for su suggesting that not all investment in ICT, even if it enhances productivity, increases the size of the pie that raises incomes as a whole, even if they're more widely distributed, is um, the only part thing to, to, to consider. So whether it's people losing their jobs and having... Um, health or a variety of other social problems along the lines like that, or just being found in jobs that they found to be dissatisfactory. They, they invested in their skills and ended up doing this sort of lousy, routine, menial task. Um, and that, that can have um, impacts on psyche and health as well. Um, those are things that are currently kind of outside the, the calculations that we're doing, and I, and I think that's very important to, to consider. I mean, absolutely, yes, why not? That's, that's um, um, uh, there's an important social cost there that, that, that um, 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 should, there should be some, some way of attempting to deal with that, yeah. Um, if I understand right, one of the other trends, the other side is in, in terms of recruitment, a lot of the companies, rather than recruiting uh, or employing people and then training them up, expect to employ people who already have the skills. Yeah. That kind of kind of is a bit of a change from the industrial side. I understand I, that trend kind of started in the 90s and it's not just now. But have you seen examples or do you think that it'd be a case that the governments have to step in and fill that gap that is left by industries not training up people to new technologies? And if so, is, is, isn't, that, isn't that the only other option there apart from universal income that, as you rightly said, no national government is seriously considering it? Um. Yes, I mean, I think in part that the government has already stepped in into the education system in lots of different areas to the, the, the point where many employers have started taking it for granted that the role for the state is to provide the right skills and the people that are coming out of the education training system are work ready, that we have employable graduates and, and that many of the complaints about the lack of employability of graduates are, 
uh, arising from that, whereas perhaps 20, 25 years ago, someone would be given the opportunity to work to learn employability um, um, sorts of um, skills. Um, there absolutely is a role for um, um, government in, in, in all of this. I think it involves bringing firms in as partners, um, not least because governments are constrained on information about what new technologies are being developed, what new ideas are being floated, what sort of work actually might look like. Um, so, um, again, coming back to what a joined up industrial policy would look like, it would incorporate states, it would incorporate the education system, it would incorporate employers. Uh, it might involve a, a different allocation of cost sharing to one we, um, we currently have. There might be all sorts of market failures if, in fact, this burden was put onto to, um, uh, on, into employers. Um, and uh, perhaps that's a reason why many firms or many, many sort of um, highly qualified individuals are finding themselves in less rewarding work, that each individual firm isn't, isn't sort of um, uh, shifting on its own towards a particular sort of production that might better use those skills, and that, that, that's kind of a, uh, a coordination problem. Um, so all that can be brought together within, within industrial policy. Thank you. Sure, you are here. Craig, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, much. may I invite you all for a round of applause. Excellent lecture. And I'm struck by part of the discussion also that perhaps one of the interesting questions really is, is all automation inevitable in the sense that it will lead to these kinds of phenomena? I mean, I often think we, we do need to interrogate what are the conditions under which automation becomes an inevitable outcome, including with some of the consequences you have mentioned. And I think there are more cases and realities where technology did not simply progress because it was the cheaper option. Societies make choices, and I think we, we need to look at some of the evidence. I've now listened to a number of lectures over the last few weeks, looking at technology, uh, employment, uh, inequality, where in part I think societies will both be inclined to make different choices and are increasingly getting frustrated with the choices being made for them. Um, I just have to say my experience of entering a high street bank in the UK in the year 2016 is a qualitatively far worse experience than it was in 1986. And um, that has a lot to do with automation. Is this the kind of you know, market choice that becomes inevitable just because it's cost cutting, efficient? Clearly questions that are being discussed in many contexts. We um, just want to make a couple of brief announcements. Tomorrow, um, a very special event here, also at the Oxford Martin School. Um, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative will have a panel with Professor Sir Tony Atkinson, who led the Monitoring Global Poverty Work and Report that, together with the World Bank, uh, is being launched on, uh, on Friday here uh, with a global launch. And um, we obviously would invite you and, uh, to please register. Um, oh, sorry, no, it says already the event is full, but will be live webcast. Um, it, uh, why does it say, oh, sorry? This is, oh no, this is the next one. Sorry, I should have done my homework more properly. So, um, Clara, for tomorrow, poverty, monitoring global poverty is still open? Yes. Okay. Then, uh, inequality, poverty, and global development. Stefan Durkan, Professor of Economic Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government, here, Thursday, 10th of November, 5 to 6.30. Uh, that event is full, but will be live webcast. And then, the week after, 17th of November, Professor Michael Keith, Director of COMPASS, uh, a lecture on urbanization, migration, and the future metropolis. So as always, you're all welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. And Craig, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you.